heads India's national stock exchange and carries her responsibility pretty effortlessly. In fact, few know the workings of the NSC as well as Chitra Ramakrishna who was part of the five-member team that set out to do what seemed impossible. Take on the then 116-year-old BSC or Bombay Stock Exchange and that too just when the stock markets in India had been shaken up by one of the biggest scams. So when I caught up with the MD of NSC, I began by asking her how her journey has been. No, in retrospect actually, if you think about it, um, 20 years ago when NSC was an idea and uh, IDBI was asked to sort of do some uh, spade work and get the organization started, uh, Mr. Nadkarni was the chairman in IDBI and then. And, uh, you know, the development institutions in those days used to take up a lot of these organization creation kind of, uh, you know, projects. So, as somebody who worked in IDBI, I was fortunate to have the chance to, you know, raise your hand and say, I want to be part of that. Uh, to be very honest, when we started the NSC project, I don't think we, uh, we really imagined how large this would be. Really? Yeah. I, I mean, the idea was great and uh, it was clear that it is an idea that can change a paradigm. But how long that would take and how much that would impact was not, uh, was not first of all, something that we uh, spent too much time on. We just thought the idea is good, we just need to give it a shot and let's see what happens. Mm. Right? And uh, what really helped was, there is a plus and minus in everything. What really helped was that we didn't know much about markets. Right? So it was good to be so innocent of, you know, uh, what the real practices were and uh, you know we're not stalwarts in the market then we started studying and looking at all of this only in the few years before and uh, when we got onto the team uh, to set up NSC so we had a fresh approach to everything and we had an ability to ask why not mm. right and I think that helped uh, it also helped because you didn't feel weighed down by what is not possible Right? If you are in the thick of things, many times you discount many things saying, oh, maybe this is not possible. Maybe you overanalyze. Market, yeah. And maybe you think market won't accept this. So you end up uh, sort of, uh, uh, I would say, putting a negative vote on some of the new ideas. Mm -hmm. So I think all of that helped. And uh, of course, what really helped was nobody expected that we would succeed. So it gave us a you know fresh space to sort of just do what we were hearing uh, as the need of the hour and putting that together and building a plan and uh, always when there is under expectations it's easy to perform so i think all of that really helped us as a team how did you land up in the five people who uh, who set it up because you know uh, the story goes that you were at idbi you went to sebi you worked on a lot of regulatory issues came back and you were marketing the bond issue which you did very, very well, and that's how you got picked out by Dr. Patel. Is that how it went? Actually, uh, you know, in retrospect, we can put a lot of these things together huh. in a very meaningful fashion, but it isn't always so. Huh. You know, uh, as I always like to say, when I was in ITBI, I think the biggest uh, thing I enjoyed about the job was that you had an opportunity to sort of put your fingers into many things. Mm. And so whenever some new assignment like this came up, uh, people had a chance to volunteer and say, you know, you know can I be part of this team? So uh, it's always been my take that if you are part of something new and something that's impacting, you get to learn a lot and you can contribute as well. That was the reason I went into the SEBI team. It was trying to create a blueprint for securities law in the first place and, you, you know, it's fascinating. And uh, the same reason goes for why I volunteered for NSC. And to be very honest, it's not like too many people queue up and take these opportunities, you know. Mm -hmm. So it's not like 100 people applied and 5 got picked up. Not really. And I think few people volunteer for these things. And so you have a better chance at being part of these teams. Mm -hmm. It's also about the time, you know. So I had Chanda and Shikha on the show and they were talking about how at the early stages of their life, ICICI was developing and expanding rapidly. So there were a lot of new opportunities out there. Do you think women take enough of it? 
Uh, actually, I will generalize that comment to say I don't know if enough employees take those opportunities. Yeah. Yeah, because there are always few people who volunteer for these uh, kind of assignments that come up. Uh, it may just be coincidence that you know there were more women than men during that phase of time, but um, it is a generic observation that when there are hundreds of employees, you will find hardly 10, 15 people who volunteer for these kind of assignments. Mm. Because when you volunteer for these assignments, you don't really know if this is going to be a big thing or is just experience gained, right? So what prompts you to get into these assignments is what counts. In the journey uh, that you saw, you also when you start out something new, you need to be entrepreneurial. One part of, of doing something new and being a pioneer of sorts is A, you have to take the risk and B, you have to really spend, it's not a structured process -led, led environment, you have to really push the envelope. Do you see enough people, especially women, taking up those kind of roles? Again, uh, this is not unique to women. Okay. Mm. Uh, this is something in fact I always share with my team. The ownership mindset, that's what I like to call it, you know, an ownership mindset should be there in every employee. Because what is an ownership mindset end of day? What you do, you think you are the CEO of what you do, right? So uh, if you have that mindset, then it doesn't matter whether you know you have your own business or whether you are part of a large institution because then you own up for your SBU, you own up for your desk, you have the ability to take the decisions on that. You may not take it but you will spearhead it with your CEO, you will you know get their buy-in, you will make things happen. So I think an ownership mindset distinguishes some employees from many others and some of them may be entrepreneurs, some of them may be running institutions, that really doesn't matter. In this, I don't see a big distinction between men and women. I find enough women having that ownership mindset too. Possibly that could be a factor, but you know, if you look at the public sector, the institutional world, uh, prior to, for example, our generation, the percentage of women were very small. So those who decided to get on with a job, right, uh, had very defined ambitions in the sense that I remember a lot of my seniors in IDBI, for example, they were keen to be financially independent. But they are not, uh, I, I never heard many of them saying, you know, I, I want to retire as uh, ED of this uh, organization, I want to retire as MD of this organization. I think financial independence as a goal was important for them and I think they achieved it to a large extent. And I think the generation of ours, which was really some of the, you know, from the B schools and uh, the chartered accountants and others who were direct recruits who then came in, they had different aspiration levels. And we found a better gender balance in, you know, this set of people who came in. And this set of people who came in were actually more uh, oriented towards uh, performing like their peers and, you know, being counted as equal. So if they stepped up, the organization always reached out and gave them those opportunities as well. It's generally seen, Chitra, that in any career, uh, women really fall off the workspace between say the junior to mid. It's not really a glass ceiling in that context. It's just that not enough women are getting to the glass ceiling to, to uh, stay the course. What uh, do you think, what comes to your mind as the biggest challenges that women face at that level? Because you know, the equal number of men and women pass out of colleges or institutes. Looking at, for example, all the people we hire and uh, you know how we are able to sort of grow them along our uh, yeah. management layers. I find that today far more women are professionally equipping themselves to embark on careers, but they are not equipping themselves to take the decisions when they are at crossroads. So they do spend 15, 18 years acquiring a lot of degrees, etc., etc., but a large part of them 
still feel very torn when they have to take these decisions of you know maybe I have to take a break in my career or maybe I have to do another job and so on. See my, my take really is that there will always be crossroads in everything that you do in life, right? And if we are able to think through, if we are able to talk through and equip ourselves for some of these crossroad decisions, then we will be much more comfortable and confident taking those decisions when we are actually faced with those situ situations. Mm -hmm. Rather than at that situation getting a huge amount of advice around us and therefore, you know, somewhat getting overwhelmed with what decisions we should take. So we do find people falling off the radar, uh, you know, three, four years into the jobs and for the next 10 to 12 years when they are going through either a marriage phase or a children phase and so the support for the children as they grow up. Again, when the children are 10, 12, then you find that, you know, you, you could easily balance these two, but then you've lost a lot of years in between. So if you had a way to work this ahead of time, you could have tied up this period through. I don't mean to say that we should be equally ambitious all through our careers because this is a long haul, right? So there are times that, you know, life, uh, the family takes precedence, there are times the work takes precedence, but it's a good idea to keep both. That's, that's a very well put point, uh, Chitra. So I'm going to take it into two extremes. One, you think uh, women don't plan careers enough you know i think the first work actually starts within you know the support systems are all important and we have to plan for those no doubt but i think the biggest challenge is to first you know have that conviction and clarity within oneself mm -hmm. because if you have the conviction that this is important for you this is important for your professional fulfillment for your fulfillment as a human being then it's a given, then you're not questioning yourself, should I be doing this, right? So this is given. It's like dealing with a situation that you know has to be there, right? I think this is the biggest challenge. Most women struggle with this question in that period, maybe it's not that important, maybe I can do this after 10 years, maybe it's really okay if I don't sort of, I mean, everyone to their own, right? And maybe many of them do get satisfaction doing what they're doing. My point is that if profession and a work and contribution to work is important for you and that's why you invest much in equipping yourself, then you need to take that as a given and you must not sort of give that up along the way, right? So then you work around that. It's like there are many things we, we take as given in life. For example, I may say that I have to be in Bombay, that's given. Right? Once, right or wrong, once you take the decision, then you work everything else around it. So career is like that. If you assume this is given, right, then you work everything else around it. You don't ask, do I need a career? Do I uh, really need to work? You don't ask those basic questions again. I think this is the biggest challenge. And once this is clear, then you have the time, luxury of time on your side to plan. Okay, how can I garner the resources to support my goal. Do you see this mind shift uh, happening with new generations that are coming in or are these problems as fundamental now as they were in the last generation of women? You know, there is, there are two things that are happening. One is certainly um, a lot of the new generation is more confident about their decision, right? Uh, but on the other hand, I think the support systems are falling off. So they have access to less and less support systems in nuclear families and cities and so on. This is a challenge. So a lot of times what I hear is many of the women have to take this or that kind of a decision. And I really wish that extra effort to do this and that in everything in life will be more optimal than this or that, right? So it is, it's completely a personal call, but end of the day, um, the reality is girls are definitely becoming more confident and they do want careers. 
but the amount of support that's available to them is waning. So they have to be a little more careful, more that planned. That's a challenge, yeah, that is a challenge. Let's talk about the workplace. At a senior level that you are in, Chitra, do you, have you faced uh, resentment or the, the fact that in a room full of men it's difficult to speak up? What are the challenges you face as you went up the leadership ladder when you were talking to an external uh, you know, community or an external group of people? Uh, what are the challenges there? There are two things which have always been in my favor, have been an advantage, so perhaps I'm a wrong example, hmm. which is that the financial sector has always been very agnostic to gender, you know. Second, if you are part of an organization from the beginning, you always have an advantage. So you don't have the challenge of, you know, having to be heard and whether you're taken seriously, etc. because, you know, you're involved with the organization. So, in a sense, I'm a wrong, wrong example because I've never had those challenges. I've never, you know, had difficulty in sort of uh, raising my uh, presence or, you know, putting in my contribution or being recognized or any of that. Even in my DBI, I'm so and so in NSE. Mm. So, in a sense, is it also that the financial uh, uh, community or the financial banking and finance space has had a clear run? of having women at different levels. So the men are also used to women taking equal decisions. And is, is that the learning for other sectors? That maybe you need to give time, that these things are not done in a hurry? It's, it's a bit of both. It's a bit of both. You need the supply side. You need more women coming in. You need them to be wanting to go across different careers. Even now you find women predominantly looking at a few career options. They don't really look at a manufacturing or, you know, a shop floor kind of an opportunity. Those are exceptions. So supply side is one. Second, of course, you know, more people uh, from experience will learn that it's a very healthy mix to have, uh, you know, a good amount of women and men in a team because they always bring very different perspectives. Even in your team, uh, for example, my regional heads, many of them are uh, women. Uh, there are, you know, there are very few things I have to worry about in terms of managing with them because, you know, the sense of responsibility comes very naturally to women. So, if you give them something, you know, they will run with it and there is something they will come back to you. So, uh, women bring very different, uh, you know, talent sets and complement a lot of things what you know, the men team members uh, would uh, appreciate and would do well with having that complementary set in the So team. you say that it brings a 360 degree yeah. view on a lot of aspects. Tell me, as a leader, facing some challenging times, you've gone through some tough turns, has, has your reaction been very different from your predecessors, how you would approach a particular problem? Do women, I mean, do you have something unique because you're a woman or do you think leaders are very individualistic anyways? I think, you know, there are qualities that leaders do well to have and that is nothing to do with being a woman or a man. As they say, you know, being patient or I mean, listening to everybody, this is something that every, every leader has to do. So, uh, it's more to do with your nature than whether you're a man or a woman. Again, no leader will be like another leader, right? So each one brings his own uh, basket of personality traits and uh, priorities, which make his delivery very different from somebody else's. The other view is that for a woman to be a leader, you have to be extra aggressive because you would have fought your way up. I mean, that's the, the general perception and that you have to be terribly ambitious and that you know, that becomes your nature. But I haven't really seen that in the women leaders I've interviewed. So it's a complete myth according to me. Uh, what do you think? I mean, do you think you have to fight harder to prove yourself, work harder? You know, there's one thing I've certainly uh, believed in and uh, it is held out in all these years. You must be yourself, right? You should not try to be anyone else. And if you're a woman and that brings certain things to the fore, so be it. Right? I think this race to be like everyone else and the race to prove that you are equal to a male counterpart etc. is not necessary and completely uncalled for. 
and talk about ambition as I said each one is driven by something right if you are not driven by uh, something you won't get where, where you are today what you are driven by can be different but you have to be inspired to do what you are doing day in and day out you must want to come and you must want to achieve something and that's what I think takes you forward in the long haul uh, it can't be just you know some designations and roles it has to be doing meaningful work I, that brings me to the logical question you have had pretty big shoes to fill you know for, with your predecessors has that ever uh, been something that has been in the back of your mind that you have to prove yourself or do you think this particular mantra also goes for the way you have handled your role in the last year completely I mean each one has his own shoes to fill right you try to do good work and I think value will follow and there is a lot of opportunity to do good work right more importantly we have to look at what is in the long term interest what is going to benefit a larger set of stakeholders and if that doesn't happen in three months that's okay right because institutions last for several decades and if you start processes that build value for that institution in the medium long term the value will get automatically created so I think that's all one should be focused on this is not a you know there is not a me to, there is not a race to show something every three months. No. Last set of questions, do you think people are in a hurry when you, you, when, when you meet a lot of people, men or women, a hurry to reach the top and are they missing the point then? Actually whenever I go to schools, this is something that uh, you know I consciously sort of put across because yes, I do find that a lot of people who step out of colleges have plans. Um, in what can you do in three years what can you do in five years kind of thing and uh, just just to set them thinking many times I ask so after that what would you do <laughs> right because you've got 30 years ahead of you so what would you do after five years if you've reached everything that you have to so uh, uh, my take is that focus on what you can do and others other things will follow and focus on what you can do long term so that the short term will follow Right? So yes, it is a mindset and you can't blame anybody because a lot of the noise that you hear around you today is uh, you know quarterly results and you know uh, prices, uh, share prices and so on. So you can't blame them because that's the kind of performance metrics that is put before them. Mm. But while you can't ignore this and you don't need to ignore this, if you focus on long term value creation, this should follow. Last question, for a woman or a worker who is watching this show, what would your advice be? Look for opportunities around you. Second, be driven by something. Be driven by something that you want to achieve. Then you will identify these opportunities. And thirdly, once you have decided that this is worth striving for in life, then make it work for you and don't give up your aspirations halfway. Thank you so much, Jitra. Thank you.